this episode, I want to talk about microservices and the monolith. So a monolith is where you have your entire application and it's in one single place. So you essentially have all of your view code, all of your backend code, everything that's needed to get this application up and running, except for external dependencies, all in one single repository. So your application, and then you have microservices where you have little bits and pieces of your code all over the place. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a great way to keep your code isolated. So if you have several different teams working on one humongous application, then you can separate all your code over into much smaller chunks and have people be responsible for certain areas. So you might have a certain team doing any kind of processing, you have another team doing some other business logic, and then you can have more teams do in other areas, and they are responsible for those sections of the application as a whole. And did you know that you can go to railstore.com to get your own Ruby on Rails t-shirt or your Drift and Ruby t-shirt? So be sure to check that out and use the promo code Ruby for free shipping within the United States. And so there's a lot of benefits going one way or another. With the microservices way, it is great for small teams, and it's also good for large teams. It's all going to be how you organize your code. If your code is a mess, then it doesn't matter if it's one person, 10 people, or 100 people working on that application. Not only are you going to step on each other's toes, but it's just going to be a nightmare to handle. Same way with microservices, if you have a bunch of people working on sloppy code, then it's going to be very hard to maintain. And so I have a few rules of thumbs when working on a microservice. When I'm working on a microservice, that particular microservice needs to have very small amount of code. It should do one thing and it should do that one thing very well. This microservice should not have multiple entry points into its functionality. And when you find that a microservice is starting to do a lot more things than just that one particular task, then you're starting to have this majestic microservice, which isn't really micro anymore. And so it's said that testing and managing microservices is really easy on large applications, but it's really going to depend on whether or not microservices is a good fit for your team, because there's a lot of drawbacks to using microservices the deployment architecture becomes significantly more complex. Not only are you having to worry about deploying the application code, but of all the other microservices as well. And if one microservice is dependent on another microservice, and that's dependent on another one, and they are all using very specific versions, then you could find yourself in a situation where you've deployed the wrong version on one microservice, and then the other two are the correct version, but you're getting an error and you're not really sure where that error is coming from. Versus a monolith where everything is bundled in together. So you won't ever have this issue of conflicting versions. But at the same time, a lot of people say, well, monoliths don't scale. On the other hand, with microservices, it's really easy to scale up a particular service that is going to be hit very often. So if you're using something like Kubernetes, then you can easily change the number of minimal pods that will get spun up. And then that microservice would be able to handle a whole lot of load without wasting the resources on a lot of the other services that aren't getting hit as much. But you can do the same thing with a majestic monolith, to some degree. You're able to separate out your application code still being within the monolith, do a lot of things in background jobs. Using Sidekick, Rescue, or Delayed Job, you're able to extract a lot of the code that would be on the front end that could be slowing down your clients, or it could also just be doing a lot of work that's taking up a lot of system resources on your web servers. You can push those off to a background job, so those are happening in the background, and then once they are completed, then they can forward up the result to the front end server, and you can do a lot of that with Action Cable, Stimulus Reflex, or a number of other options. And one argument to use microservices that a lot of people say is that it's easier to test. You only have to test one little bit of small code and you know if it's working or not. And you can't get that kind of functionality in a monolith. 
Well, I don't think that's true at all, because if you're organizing your monolith correctly, and if you're not dumping everything in a controller or a model, if you're using plain old Ruby objects, then you can get that same level of abstraction that you can with the microservice where you have one function doing something really well, it has one entry point, and you can test that easily. And there's actually a fun hybrid between both the monolith and the microservice, and that's with a modular monolith. Shopify has explored doing the modular monolith where all the application code still resides in the single repository. However, they've broken out the application code doing a few different methods. One method that I've explored doing in the past is using Rails engines where I would have a feature of code so it could be something like a shopping cart feature, or it could be a chat system, or some other kind of project that can be extracted into its own separate space. So with the idea of the modular monolith is that you would have your one big application, and then it can be broken down by several different engines, and those engines could then have their own responsibilities that they take care of. And that engine itself could be its own monolith, but that is one way of separation of code. So your main application in the controllers isn't getting overwhelmed if you have hundreds or thousands of controllers. If you are wanting to stick to the monolith route, then you can separate your code and still have a pretty good separation of concerns with name spacing. And if I'm going to be building an application that's not going to be huge, it's going to be relatively medium in size, meaning only a couple of hundred of controllers or so, then that application I would probably do in namespacing instead of going the microservices route. But again, all of that's going to depend on your business. If you're a single developer and you don't have a big team, so you don't have any kind of DevOps teams that's handling your deployments, then going the microservices route might be a good educational piece, but in the long run, it's going to mean a lot more work for you as intercommunicating with microservices is just going to be one extra step that you'll have to do. And so if you haven't gathered by now, that one big difference between the monolith and the microservice is the complexity. A monolith is going to be much simpler to maintain, deploy, and manage in the long run. And this is in reference to smaller applications versus a microservices of an application at the same level. It is going to be more complex. It's not only going to be more complex to develop in, it's going to be more complex on the database side. If each microservice has its own database that it needs to read from and then write to, depending on information it's getting from other microservices, then it's almost inevitable that you will be dealing with data integrity at some point, where one microservice didn't quite get the updates from another microservice, and now the data is out of sync. Whether it's information about your users, products, or whatever else, I've seen it happen and it gets pretty ugly to be able to weed out all of the stale data in an application and try to get it updated and refreshed and back to a more healthy state. And another big issue that you might experience with microservices is when something doesn't work. It's inevitable that you'll come to a point where you find that something doesn't quite work correctly and you're trying to figure out who is responsible for this issue. Rather not who's responsible, but rather what's responsible for this issue. It could be something as simple as a microservice is not communicating correctly and you didn't quite handle the errors properly in one microservice, so you eventually run into an issue where the issue looks like it's over here, but it's actually a microservice way far out. And so I think that the concept of microservices can make sense for large companies if they have many separated and isolated teams, because these teams will probably never get the full grasp of an entire application. If your team is small enough to where they can get the full grasp of an application, then microservices may not be the correct solution for you. And personally, I think that in a lot of cases, unless if you're a company like Shopify, where you are serving millions and millions of requests per second or per minute, then it may not make sense from the perspective of scalability because a monolith can scale just as well as a microservice as far as horizontally scaling, with some exceptions, of course. So overall, I think that microservices is a technical debt that your company would have to assume 
or accept because you find it, it is more simple to develop in microservices than it is the monolith application. And so I am a big believer of the majestic monolith as DHH would describe it, where all your application code is in one place and you're deploying that one application code. And I would go as far as to say, in most cases, there are exceptions of course, that if you think microservices is the proper route because of the complexity of your application code, then you might have an issue of organizing your application code and microservices won't fix that. You can still make a mess of microservices, you can make them much larger than what they're supposed to be, and you can then deal with a whole new set of problems of intercommunication with microservices, the database aspect of not only the database being synchronized with the other databases for the relevant pieces of data, but then also you are then increasing your database size. Not to mention, if you are deploying this to something like Azure, AWS or Google Cloud Platform, in many cases, those databases that you would get from them have a certain number of connection limits. And so if your microservices is going to have thousands and thousands of microservices that are going to connect to a database, then you could exceed the database connection quota, making you have to scale up the size of the database. And by doing that, you're not only going to be paying a lot more money for that, but you may not actually see the benefits of it. So in some cases, microservices can actually be a lot more expensive, not only in the short term of the development costs, but then also the maintaining of the microservices and the handling of deployments, but then also the infrastructure costs as well. So before you jump into creating a new application of microservices, you really need to decide if it is the correct route for your company. Bring in some other stakeholders who know a bit about this and that could help guide you to the proper solution for your business. Even with a monolith application, you should still be able to support hundreds of developers working on that application if the code is well isolated and well tested. But if you're having to deal with applications where models are thousands of lines long, and you think the solution to address these issues is to switch over to microservices, then you might end up repeating those same bad habits over in the microservices as well, and then those will become unmaintainable as well. So ultimately, going this route is not a light decision to make, it's something that you'll have to make, and it has to be a conscious decision that you have exhausted and you have outgrown the monolith service, and now you need to actually go the microservices route. So if you've liked this video, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe if you haven't. And if you don't like this video, I would love to hear your feedback and some other thoughts that you have. All of this information, of course, is based on my own personal experiences and or research that I've done about this topic. But you may have had other experiences where microservices has been a great solution to your problem. And I think that's great if you were able to get it working properly and if it's been a maintainable experience that you've had so far. Well, that's all for this video. Thank you for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.